Let me tell you just for a few minutes, what is this? What is STEM So What? For those that haven't been here, just a show of hands. If you've been to one of these sessions before, just raise your hand, raise your hand. If you've been to, okay? If this is your first time, raise your hand and wave it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so we have a lot of new individuals. So what is STEM so what? So the question begs an answer. You're, some of you are taking classes in STEM and you're probably at some point asked the question, so what? Math, so what? Biology, so what? Geology, so what? It does beg a question and an answer. The answer is all of those STEM areas are relevant to not just STEM professionals, but to everyone. And so we have tried to create these sessions so that we can answer and respond to that question. In this case, physical science, so what? And so the presentation is going to be a talk on nature and power and politics and this environmentalism in the age of climate change. And so it's quite interesting to see how STEM connects with our everyday life and the things we do. So we're trying to respond and share this answer to the question, STEM, so what? Why is Tarrant County a, a good institution to do some things like this? Well, one of the things we know is that STEM professional, the STEM workforce, uh, we are, we're, we're in need of more individuals. Not only STEM professionals, but we need diversity in STEM, in the STEM workforce. And Tarrant County College is a great location because we serve a diverse population of students throughout Tarrant County, throughout North Texas, and this entire region. And so you have a lot of diverse educational backgrounds and pathways that you're traveling on. So this is the best place to be. Tarrant County is a very large county with respect to the state. That is, we're the third largest county in Texas. Tarrant County College is the 13th largest community college in the nation, the 13th largest. So we have a lot of students who pass through our halls, walk through our halls and sit in our classes, and we have a huge impact. Fort Worth is, uh, it's, it's Fort Worth is the 13th largest city in the nation. And so any minor change that we can make at Tarrant County College, even if it's a minor one, has the potential to be significant for this region of North Texas and for the nation. If we can get more STEM and STEM-related professionals to, uh, to recruit, to reach them, to, uh, uh, to graduate, then it makes a difference. So you may not be a STEM professional or have a desire to go into STEM, but you probably know someone who would be interested in what we're talking about and what we're doing. We plan to continue these sessions uh, throughout the next year, and so we have some great sessions planned and would hope that you would be able to, uh, if not come yourself, to direct other individuals, siblings, uh, you know, friends, family, uh, those that you know would benefit from this. Let me take a minute to recognize some student leaders. That is, we have student activities on, on Northwest Tarrant County College, and those student leaders are over student activities, and they do some phenomenal things. Do we have any student officers of any of our student clubs here tonight who would want to just stand up and introduce yourself, say who you are, I knew you just took a big bite of that sandwich. <laughs> 
But I'm going to bring the mic to you and just real quick, I will pull the mic away from you if you go too long. But just introduce yourself and share what club you're, you're with and if you have any interesting activities coming up. You could have warned me, Professor Hobbs. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm the chess club president. Uh, I forgot all the questions. What was it? <laughs> uh, so what club, do you, oh, have up? like what do I do? Or well, I'm not an interview. Sorry. Oh, no, Gosh, I'm nervous. Well, that's a lot of people. Uh, chess club. Chess club. Yeah. Um, so, well, that's not. That's a different thing. Uh, we meet every Thursday, actually, three to four forty-five. Uh, we just play chess. We make fun of each other. Um, I don't really know. It's pretty relaxed. You're in chess club. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No thanks. Thank you. Any other, any, any other club, club leaders here? Okay. I'll come around. That's interesting. Um, so my name is Dan Rodriguez, and I write, I'm the president of the Dodgeball Club, which uh, we, um, we host every Fridays from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., and tomorrow's pretty much our last meeting. So if you are interested in, um, well, if you guys are interested, if there are any athletics or any, anything who loves to have fun or anything else, um, we're, we'll be open from 2 to 4, two to four and yeah, come out, come out and just have some fun for Dodgeball Club, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other student club leaders? Okay, an opportunity for faculty and staff, if they have any announcements that are relevant to STEM, that is any summer plans, summer internships, summer research, anything, faculty, anything, mm -hmm. any announcements on that? This is a place to do that, recognize. Okay. So Earth Day, right? Earth Day is coming up, and tomorrow we are going to have a lot of festivities on our campus. So if you haven't signed up yet, there's going to be disc golf, and I believe the 5K is on Saturday. So if you like to run, yes. Or walk. Or walk. Or walk. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we have reached the point where we are ready for some inspiration and some additional information. And so I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to keep the mic. So if you have questions I'm going to, or comments, I'm going to want to bring the mic to you. But let me just uh, give it over to our guest speaker and allow him to introduce himself and get going. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Can you all hear me if I talk like this? Is that good? I'm sure it is. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to stick to a script so I don't go too long because I have a tendency to talk too much. So hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well this evening, and many thanks for being here, even if it is only for extra credit, whoever my students are. So. so my name is James, for those of you who don't know me, and I'll be talking to you this evening about nature, power, and politics, and I promise to do my best to be respectful of all of your times, as it is the evening, and it is some of our weekends starting up. Um, so, and we'll try to get, I'm also operating on two different, my computer here is different from here, so. Uh, uh oh. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not. We'll see. Okay, so imagine. I'm going to begin with a story, and the story has two very different scenarios with two very different outcomes. So, uh, no. Oh, y'all saw it. I'm, again, I'm operating on two different things. So, okay. Oh, no. I got to go back. Ah, technical difficulties. Uh-oh. Nope. Now it's go. Oh. I apologize. I'm not good at this. Color. Yeah, color. <laughs> nah. I can't go back. Why doesn't this work? Okay. Uh-oh. Well, now that looks silly. Okay, anyway, so scenario one is one of a utopian hope that will reduce 
or eliminate our use of non-renewable energy, put environmentally sound practices in place. So this will in turn reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and stop the warming trend. Hopefully we will reforest, build green roofs on all of our buildings and sequester carbon at a rate that will allow atmospheric and oceanic systems to recover from the far, uh, warming trend. So imagine, if you will, the adoption of organic farming and we reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides. We will reduce landfills and toxic waste by rejecting our throwaway society habits by recycling clothes and other consumer goods, com composting household waste and reducing packaging. We will, design, we'll, we will design green communities so that we walk and bicycle rather than use cars, increase public transportation, encourage locally grown production of food, and this list could go on and on. And that sounds pretty rad, right? Right. Cool. All right, now imagine scenario two. So this is one of a dystopian future generated amidst an increase in environmental concern. The outcomes here are equally as plausible. So you might easily imagine the global north, especially here in North America, will not be willing to rapidly make any major changes in the overuse of non-renewable energies, especially the oil we use to run our businesses, our homes, and to drive our cars. So quickly industrializing nations will take note and not be willing to sacrifice their attempt to match environmentally exploitive ways of living. Global climate change will in turn accelerate as a result. So increasing cost and decreasing availability of the oil will only serve to legitimate US military operations in countries that have oil resources. This future will be divided increasingly between those who can afford to access water and good weather under conditions of increased weather vulnerability and those who cannot. Major floods and droughts and food shortages will kill millions of people and disease caused by the disruptions as well as increased or increasing pests and viruses will devastate those who cannot protect themselves or gain access to medical care. A migration of uh, elites to cooler climate will produce new fortress communities with their own food, water, and energy uh, resources. So where are we headed in the age of climate change? Well, it's probably somewhere in reality in between both of those scenarios. So this makes clear the disturbing idea that these two scenarios are not really opposites at all. It's quite possible that a green society could be created for the rich while the poor live in a world of toxins, scarcity, and violence. Therefore, if we want to create a truly sustainable future, we must think about the social inequities or inequalities as much as we think about environmental problems, and we must understand their interrelationships. So clearly, we have many environmental problems to deal with. What is not clear is how to deal with them. So an outline of tonight's talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey into STEM, and then we're going to go into um, some things that I found along the way in my journey. Um, as uh, we can see here, the an analysis of nature, power, and politics, and we'll talk a little bit envi about environmentalism. And then at the end, I would like to just kind of wrap it or bring it all together and talk about something or a place a little closer to home in Dallas and talk a little bit about environmental justice. I got this. Okay, so before I go any further too, I just want to say some of the subjects are a little tricky to navigate. So with that being said, I want to explicitly state that the views expressed here tonight and here within are my own and they don't necessarily reflect the views of Tarrant County College. Okay, so who am I? I'm James. <laughs> Uh, I uh, am a geologist by education, educator by trade. Um, I'm currently a PhD student uh, working on my dissertation. I'm on the dissertation phase. Yes, and it is, I'm so ready to be done. But I have, through my journey of that, I have focused my, believe it or not, so how Archie was saying that TCC is one of the largest degree granting institutions in the nation. Um, but how my journey into sustainability and leadership and environmental justice actually started from the, the lack of any outward facing sustainability policies from TCC. So this kind of got my ball ticking, or not my ball ticking, my, uh, my brain ticking and the ball rolling um, of kind of, <laughs> of all of these things. But this is not about TCC, but, um, I'm full-time faculty 
Uh, I teach geology. All of our geology faculty are here. Um, and also have a geology podcast, which uh, Brian, this handsome fellow holding the dog, <laughs> is also here. Um, so again, my name is James. And to start this, in the beginning, I want this journey to begin, is that I was just a boy who liked rocks. I kept my head down toward the ground, looking for the things to throw or collect if they looked cool enough. So this is where I grew up till about the age of 10, 11 or so. So this is 615 Northampton. This is the house right, right here. And this is where I actually learned to ride my bike for the first time. And I remember explicitly where, when this KFC was first built because I had the opportunity to give cars uh, a car wash whether they wanted one or not. <laughs> so fast forward a little bit, a brief history of events. I graduated high school. I attended Southwest Texas State. And that may date me because it's now Texas State. I actually voted on the, the name changer, was part of the the class, I like Southwest Texas State. But as we can see here is, you know the saying that if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile? Yeah, well, apparently my parents gave me 18 and a half feet because I took the entire 224 miles between Arlington, Texas and San Marcos, Texas, and I did one thing. I did that one thing very well, and that wasn't going to class. <laughs> so, <laughs> And on top of that, I somehow convinced my parents to give me a second chance where I made, uh, I doubled my score. I made, <laughs> I made a 0 0.8 my second go around, but it ultimately is what led me joining the military. So my time in the military, um, again, it was a, a unique experience. I, I think it's important to note that through like all these failures that if you look at me and think that I've had my life together, uh, that is simply not true. Uh, I'm a non-traditional student in a variety of different ways. But as we can see, these are just random pictures from Iraq. Um, let's see. But we can see that here, I'm just still a kid who likes rocks, right? I was a geologist before I even knew I wanted to be a geologist. So we can see here the, some of the conditions. So we would, uh, I mainly did convoys, but uh, the few times that I did get to go out and interact with the, the local community, uh, it was, there were often conditions in this. I was in very South Iraq. And we can see just the, I don't know, when I see that, this was the, this community's drinking water. So um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, it's just, not, I guess in our viewpoint, that wouldn't be something that we would just want to go take a cup full, boil it, and drink it. I had imagined so. But subsequently, looking at these pictures retrospectively, what I've also noticed, and if anybody else noticed, that there is just a lot of children and there are a lot of women. And um, in terms of this and the, ex and the exposure to some of these environmental uh, I guess not sound things. Now I will, the next slide, if uh, this is a disclaimer or a uh, turn your head if you don't want to see, uh, I guess, certain things, but I think it's important to who I am as a story. Um, and on September 28th in 2005, uh, it was probably the worst day of my life. Uh, I was a first responder when our convoy got hit by an IED. And not to dwell too much on this, but the, the two takeaways that I wanted to leave you with here um, is that learning is very important. So we trained almost every day and learned how to respond to situations like these. And there are a lot of moving parts that happen really quickly in these type of situations. But what it also taught me is that learning is not everything because no amount of training in the world can prepare anybody to go through something like this. And there are traumas from that day that actually still live with me to this day. And even though this happened coming up on 18 years ago, uh, what I find interesting and kind of just this interconnectedness of things, I didn't, I didn't know that TCC had this, but there is a, uh-oh, oh, I can't do that. I got to do this, right? Oh, shit. No. There is, I don't know, between, if anybody's been there, between WTLO and I think it's WFAB, 
I still get the opportunity on a daily basis to go visit my buddies. And in that way, I get to keep their spirit alive, which I think is really cool. That's something that TCC does here at this campus. So, and even though what happened many years ago, I did the best that I could and I kept my head down and I soldiered on the best way that I knew how to. Yeah. So we fast forward a little bit, uh, forward a little bit more. I became a rock star, like, like in my head I was a rock star. I got married, had kids, I went back to school for, I, I can't tell you how many times, and I graduated college and I actually became a real life rock star in that I studied geology. Uh, and then that wasn't good enough, so I wanted to go back to school to get my master's degree. And uh, this was a little bit of my study. So during my time in grad school, I focused on what I, I thought was just a really cool sounding job title. I wanted to be an explorational geophysicist. Uh, and what that means is that it's just, I don't know, I still don't know. I look at that and I'm like, uh, -uh. uh But so the long story short is what I did for my research is I mapped subsurface geometries and geologic structures. However, the basin that I was studying was underexplored. So I had to use, I had to integrate other geophysical methods such as gravity and magnetic surveys to help better contain my analysis. But the, the crazy thing is, is that, or it's, I don't know, crazy, but just two, works, two years worth of research on one slide is disappointing. I thought it would have been, and at the end, I was still just like left with, I don't know. Because getting a degree in petroleum geology amidst a significant downturn um, is probably not the best thing to do. So highlighted in this blue area is exactly when I started grad school and when I ended grad school. Yeah, so I, 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 even when I started working here, so I mean, the good thing, the, the silver lining is, is that TCC, Tracy Turner actually called me, and I started working here, and it's been the, probably the best decision I've ever made, because getting to do this in front of y'all is a, a passion of mine, and I truly enjoy it. Seeing y'all's aha moments is really cool. Um, but up until this point, uh, I've always kept my head down and I checked the boxes and I did my bit. But like I said, I'm, I, oh, you can't see what I've done. Here we are, so looking up and seeing the world. So, but as I am currently on my umpteenth journey back to school, rather than keeping my head down, I've begun to look up and I've begun to look at things a bit differently in how I try to think about approaching situations. So for the remainder of the time, what follows is me sharing with you a bit of my research and some thoughts that I've developed over the past few years, studying the connections between humans and nature. So I'll start by saying it's a bit like looking at the same problem, but with a different lens on. So for example, what I want everyone to do is just focus on that center dot. So don't take your eyes off of it, and I'm gonna change the slide. Keep staring into the dot. Three, two, one. So what did you see? Yeah, so that was interesting, right? So I, I want to use this as a starting point to discuss how we can begin to think about how we think about nature and what are some of the things that are hiding in plain sight because this picture never had any color to it at all. Okay. So what is nature? Uh, usually this is where I open it up, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to just talk to keep it going. So nature is probably, to me, one of the trickiest words in the English language. So the predominant view of nature has traditionally meant to describe our non-human surroundings with an understood dichotomy between what is a result of human influence and what remains untouched. So this dichotomy, or dualism, if you will, between the natural and the manufactured is, of course, artificial in and of itself. So arguments for nature have long been used to try to justify social phenomena such as racial and cultural differences. And throughout the history, nature has been used, or the idea of the natural, to justify either the way that things are or the way that things should be. So by calling something natural places that thing in an arena of truth of inevitability and immutability and beyond the reach of social criticisms. So a simple Google search will tell us what, Google, what nature is. Uh-oh. Hmm. 
So this is what Google says nature is. So uh, if you look here, I'm sure if you were to close your eyes and imagine what nature is, this is probably what comes to mind. But often missing from our imagination is the inclusion of humans into our perceptions of what nature is. However, humans are inside coexisting and interdependent with nature rather than outside and independent of it. So nature can be all of these things. It's not a one thing. It's not a one size fits all, right? So we need to expand our definitions of what nature is and move beyond this semi 19th century and, eight and 20th century ideas of nature being wilderness, non-human animals, oceans, forest, et cetera, but also include places where humans live, work, learn, play, and pray. Okay. Uh-oh. Oh, no, we're going backwards. No. Okay, so what I like to do then is um, talk about nature as a terrain of power, and this may not uh, be cogent with what I meant with current understandings, but understanding the history of the ideological uses of the concept of nature and examining the multiple ways in which the politics of the nature affect our social and environmental policies permits us to critically assess various solutions to environmental problems and social inequalities. So such critical perspectives may make the difference in having a world of elite green fortresses in a sea of poverty and war, or having an open, equal, and sustainable, sustainable society. Because powerful cultural discourses about what is natural have been involved for so long in arguments about social justice and equality, as well as arguments how to solve environmental problems, it's past time that we look at the intersections of these arguments. So you could also use it as a methodological approach. So claims of natural is the nature of something, right? So I will say this too, we should keep in mind that uh, as this is a STEM so what, so scientists do not stand outside of their theoretical and histor historical locations when they make their claims. Uh, science has been naturalized, so to speak, as the foremost authority of knowledge. Um, however, even claims from scientists should be critically examined, which may warrant a discussion on its own, so we will not go there. Uh, to move things forward, let's look at a few uh, pop culture artifacts as they can offer insight into the dominant cultural identity of a society. And I'll demonstrate just a few ways in which we can critically analyze things and to make visible some problems with nature and the natural. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. So here is a ad from the Discovery Channel, right? Nothing, nothing too terribly wrong with this. It says at the top, the faces of discovery are the faces of the world when you set your sights on the fascination of real world entertainment. Find yourself here. So we find ourselves here. So explore your world. So we see a Mayan mask or an Aztec sun mask, an Aboriginal man, a Native American man, a jet pilot in a helmet in a breathing apparatus, a woman in obscuring headdress, and a leopard or jaguar. So the ad then tells us to find yourself here. We can begin our analysis of the image by me asking whether or not any of you can find yourself in these images. Can you see yourself? Now, can anybody find the white man? Yeah? Yes? No? Just, can you see which one? Just yell it out. Bottom left. Right, good job. So in stating that these are the faces of the world, the ad here with the vaguely Aztec mask, the Aborigine, the American Indian, and the Middle Eastern woman are placed on the same plane, the natural among a primitive backdrop to the process of exploration and achievement. The jungle cat is equivalent to the natural faces, all of whom except the fighter jet pilot belong to those who have been colonized in the name of progress and discovery. So in the statement of the ad, the faces of discovery are the faces of the world, tells us that all the non-modern faces are the ones to be discovered. The pilot's mask puts him in a position of discovery, aka power, given the close connections in US cultural mythology among discovery, space, exploration, and militarism. So this set of assumptions that primitive people are closer to nature, that there is a natural evolution from primitive to civilized, and that history inevitably involves progress defined as movement towards modernization, and industrialization makes the cost of such progress for nature and for particularly people invisible. So the fact that the logo of the Discovery Channel is firmly over the mouth of the Muslim woman in effect symbolically silences the one woman present as well. So these are just a few, a few thoughts. 
So here, nature. So when a man is shown actively engaged in and in control of nature, he's usually depicted as a white, straight, and very stereotypically masculine. So for example, the left shows a white man in the midst of an exuberant exploration, escaping from the dark, claustrophobic city to the freedom of the country. Um, in splashing his way up a river, he epitomizes strength, control, and manly success. So another set of patterns in ads shows nature as heteronormative, that is supporting the idea that heterosexuality is the only natural, normal, and acceptable sexuality. So from this ad then, the, the ad for the Chevy Tracker encourages the male and female pair to be two with nature, thus sustaining the idea of heteronormativity as being the natural way of things. Okay, so here is an ad from the Environmental Defense Fund that says, if you're not recycling, you're throwing it all away. So in light of uh, Earth Day, right, we can examine this a little bit. So uh, here, recycling is not inherently a bad thing and is generally considered a good thing, right? I would say so. However, an image such as this one above or just here can give the false impression that the act of an individual AKA you yourself is the solution to saving the planet. What's more, this can lead to a false assumption that everyone's lack of recycling, no matter who they are and where they fit in the chain of production and consumption is a cause of the most important damage to the planet. That is one person could throw it away. Other problems can arise when thinking of the earth this way as an object we can gaze upon at will, owned and contained. Some scholars would argue that the whole Earth image presents the planet as naturally harmonious and pure, allowing us to fantasize that all of its occurrences are uniform and in balance without conflict and pollution. Both of these ideas, though, they inhibit us from understanding the Earth as a dynamic planet, complex, interrelated set of entities enmeshed in both conflict and cooperation, and Earth in crisis. So the whole Earth image allows us to universalize the environmental dangers to the Earth without understanding how differential power and privilege mean that responsibility for environmental devastation is not equally shared. Another common trope that we see in uh, how we depict nature and natural is that typically we view nature as feminine. So perhaps as in a mother Earth, we can see here that the Earth is in the womb of the woman. And while this is a beautiful piece of artwork, using such images of Mother Earth brings us back to the dualist notion of culture as male and nature as female, which has proven to be destructive to both women and nature. So a lot of environmental movements fall into this trap of stereotyping. So then that brings us into what, who decides what nature is and who has access to it. So this is a good transition for that. So the fact that commonplace ideas about what is natural have been implicated in justifying both social inequalities, we've talked about that. Examine how these areas are linked. So we need to entertain the idea that solving environmental problems must also involve eliminating social injustices and vice versa. We must be conscious of the ways in which we argue from the natural in that we do so with a fuller knowledge of the history and effects of such arrangements. So when we think of early environmentalism and the idea behind uh, our views of nature, so most of these men that you see here were, were white Americans, did much to create the country's national parks, forests, game refuges, um, and the system of environmental stewardship and public access. They developed the conviction that a country's treatment of its lands and wildlife is a measure of the country's character. All of these men were of the opinion that nature was worth saving for its aristotic, uh, aristocratic qualities. So we can take Grant here. Madison Grant uh, was a zoologist. He was instrumental in creating the Bronx Zoo. He founded the first organization dedicated to preserving American bison and even the California redwood. He wrote in his book, The Passing of the Great Race. Well, I'm going to take a drink real quick. The Passing of the Great Race. Now that natural selection had given way to the humanity's complete mastery of the globe, his generation had the responsibility of saying what forms of life should be preserved. So uh, just to give you an idea of what this book was about is that, that Adolf Hitler uh, actually referred to this book as his Bible when giving praise to Grant. This book also led to influencing immigration, the Immigration Act of 1924. Um, 
let's see. Oh, did I go to the next one? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Henry Fairfield Osborne headed the New York Zoological Society. He was on the board of trustees of the American Museum of Natural History. He was a member of the United States Geological Society, so the USGS. He's actually, uh, was, he actually named the T-Rex and the Velociraptor. But he wrote a foreword in Madison Grant's book, and he said, the, converse, the conservation of race, which has given us the true spirit of Americanism, is not a matter of either racial pride or racial prejudice. It is a matter of love of country. So then we get to Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the US Forest uh, Service and the country's foremost theorizer and popularizer of conservation, was a delegate to the first and second international eugenics conference in 1912 and 1921. He was also an advisory council of the American Eugenics Society from 1925 to 1935. So eugenics, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the selection of desired heritable characteristics in order to improve future generations. So we can see the inherent problem with that. So John Muir, he was the founder of the oldest environmental group, the Sierra Club. He felt a special fraternity with his four-legged animal friends and was at best ambivalent about human brotherhood. Because in 1901, an essay he wrote as to Indians, most of them are dead or civilized into useless innocence. And in the same paragraph, he wrote this about bears. Poor fellows, they have been poisoned, trapped, and shot at until they have lost confidence in brother man. And none of, these, none of this should come as a surprise. Um, in America, social power has been justified using pseudoscience of social Darwinism, which used misinterpretation of evolution to justify a lot of the inequalities we, see, we saw during the 1800s and 1900s. So here is just a political cartoon showing Uncle Sam lecturing to a group of childlike caricatures depicting the people of Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The, the more advanced students of Texas and California, Alaska, sit in the back of the classroom while the African-American student is forced to clean the windows. The Native American student is uh, confined to a corner, and the Chinese student is halted outside the door altogether. So the arguments in America um, of social Darwinism and eugenics eventually lost their popularity in the United States due to their association with the, the Nazi racial propaganda. Uh-oh. So here is a, uh, just a, 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 I guess, more of a graphic novel showing how protecting the earth became an excuse for murder. Uh, so John Muir, like, so the, when we think of the idea of what a national park is, like, right, it's preserving nature that was uh, guided by some of these principles, but uh, Muir said that he viewed the, the men walks who they displaced in, the, in Yosemite Park was the most ugly and some of them altogether hideous, and they seem to have no right place in the landscape, and I was glad to see them fading out, uh, fading out of sight down the pass. So it's not to say that none of these men did anything positive for the man and for the environment. It can only help to acknowledge just how many environmentalist priorities and the patterns of thought came from an argument among white people, some of them bigots and racial engineers about the character and future of a country that they were sure was theirs and expected to keep. So then we get into the second wave of environmentalism. It was a little less uh, like crazy in that aspect, but it did lead into um, issues of their own. But we have Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring in 1962. Uh, we have the reason why we're here today, or celebrate Earth Day Fest, Gaylord Nelson in 1970 was the first Earth Day. Uh, but the second wave of environmentalism had become to be an individual, rational, clean, apolitical process that could deliver a future that works without raising voices or mobilizing constituencies. So within this context, responsibility of creating and solving environmental problems was radically reassigned during this time from the government corporations and the environmentally short-sighted policies. They were thought to have together fostered to individualize uh, consumers and the, their decisions in the marketplace. So because as individual consumers and recyclers, we are supplied with ample and easy means of doing our bit. And this idea, the technocratic, sanitary, and individualized framing of environmentalism persists to this day, largely because it is continually reinforced. So 
what I did is that I went to the EPA website, and this is what they their their advice for us for helping saving the planet because it starts with you, right? Do we agree with that? No. Damn it. Yeah. Okay. So the privatization and individualization of responsibility for environmental problems shift blame from state elites and powerful producer groups to more amorphous culprits like human nature or all of us. So what I notice here is the complete absence of any ideas commensurate with the size and nature of the problems faced by the world's environment. Uh, so we should be... Right. Once again, that the, the mainstream environmental movement in the U.S. has run out of ideas or no worthy vision. So when confronted by environmental ills, ills many confess to caring deeply about, we seem capable of understanding ourselves only as consumers who must buy environmentally sound products and then recycle them, rather than as citizens who might come together and develop political muscles sufficient to alter institutional arrangements that drive a pervasive consumerism. Uh, so here, oh, did we go? Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about the idea of recycling, right? So I'm just pointing this one out. There's issues with all of them. But so the truth about recycling is that less than 10% of all the plastic that has ever been made has been recycled. It, the idea of recycling became a, 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 the word I'm looking for, a mainstream in our consciousness when the plastic bottling companies pushed recycling to avoid plastic bans. So they lobbied uh, government officials and they prevented that. Uh, but if you look into it, you can see that they would use words as recycling past plastic as costly, difficult, and sorting of it infeasible. Um, so we should, if you don't know, plastic is made from petroleum products, so more recycling means fewer profits for oil and gas companies. And as we can see, new plastic is cheap, or just to make new plastic is cheaper. And the, the, just the idea of recycling is you need someone to buy that recycling. So it doesn't just end when you put it into the recycling bin. It, you need someone to buy it, you need someone to purchase it, and then do something with it. But that's not what's really happening. Especially China used to buy all of our, uh, or a lot of our plastics, but it, they stopped, I believe, in 2017. I could be wrong on that number. But we know there are a lot of different types of plastic, right? So we have high-density polyethylene, uh, polyvinyl chloride, polyesterine, all of these different things. So that brings me to the point of... Uh, uh, so e the I, I go to, I see the different types of plastic, and w and hopefully we remember the, well, this happened a few months ago with the train derailment. So the, the East Palestine train wreck. So rather than linking the East Palestine, Ohio train derailment disaster to a natural culture or a national culture of impunity for corporations to disregard for working class people, the focus, unfortunately, uh, if you've paid attention to any of the, the, of the news surrounding it, is that it's there, there's been this unfortunate racial animosity towards it. So some conservatives think that the, the two weeks to gain traction in the news cycle is the result of the cultural, cultural wars, payback to predominantly white working class communities, which is simply not the case. So the story highlights when profit-hungry and unscrupulous corporations dump toxic waste into communities, nobody comes to their rescue, harm is never fully redressed, and the perpetrators are, never, are rarely held accountable. So a delay in the awareness and the aid, however, is all too often commonplace in poor communities of color. Because while this was, uh, I think, pretty well publicized, um, what's less uh, publicized is uh, less awareness is paid to uh, areas such as Jackson, Mississippi, water crisis and the lead contamination when the Gold Coast commodities illegally dumped waste into the sewers. Uh -oh. uh, the less awareness is paid to the, the Chural, South Carolina, where a textile plant routinely dumped cancer causing chemicals into the areas of black communities. Less common is the black snow in Pahokee, Florida, and the sugarcane production. And less common is Cancer Alley along the Mississippi from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and the site of petrochemical plants where the average income here is $25,000. The life expectancy is 55 years of age. 
70% of the population are without high school education. 70 to 80% of the residents there are black and three times greater at developing cancer um, against the national average. So I say even if these residents wanted to move, they simply cannot move. So this gets to my last point of the evening, and that is environmental justice and then environmental racism. So historically, it has been unjust and unequal in the distribution of environmental um, siting. So communities of color have historically faced the undue burden of environmental harm and have been forced to navigate substandard living conditions. Also, at the same time, poor people have the fewest resources to cope with these dangers legally, medically, and politically. So this two case in points here, Lois Gibbs of Love Canal. So if you know anything about the uh, toxic waste site that a city um, built a house on or built a school on top of and school children got sick, uh, the local residents, they protested. They even held an EPA official hostage at gunpoint. I'm not sure if it's gunpoint. Uh, but the end was that there were no arrests made, period, right? However, citizens of Warren, North Carolina, 1982, they were, uh, they, the, 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 the government cited PCB landfill or toxic soil to be dumped in their community. Uh, the community banded together and they said, nah. -uh. But what happened is that they ended up busing people out and taking them to jail. So 500 plus people were arrested in this area. So the Commission for Racial Justice, race was the single most important factor in predicting the placement of hazardous waste facilities. It wasn't race and something like uh, socioeconomics. It was race, period. And full stop. Okay. Dang. Okay, so a look back, so race privilege and environmental racism. So if we look back to a little bit in our community, um, just down the road, bring it all together, uh, many scientists and professionals lumber along, not really seeking change, primarily because of the way we have been trained to build on the systems of knowing. So put, a, put another way, trying to solve today's problems without, with outdated methods may not be adequate, especially when such issues are difficult and complex, i.e. combating uh, climate change, but uh, let's see here. Uh, here, the, when we think of race privilege and environmental racism, that it, it exists on every level from misdemeanors to arrests to executions to environmental exposures. Uh, and again, they've been historically exposed to these at a disparate rate. So defining the problem a little bit. So in the United States, there are over 22,000 hazardous waste sites in the United States, 80% of which are in or near communities of color. So poor people dis disproportionately bear the brunt of environmental dangers from pesticides to air pollutions to toxins to occupational hazards and their negative effects on human health and safety. Also, the percentage of population under five and uh, 65 years of age uh, show significant higher exposure rates in the highly contaminated areas. So if we could just look at the zoning practices of Dallas, Texas, here we can see um, the siting of, this is just really tall, it's small, I can't see. Industrialized zones and uh, manufacturing zones so we can see them in the polygons that are striped. And the color coding is, if it's green, it's uh, 50 to 100% of the community is population is white. And if it is red or cream, it is less than 50%, red being 25%. So we can see that even the siding of uh, where these are occurring at are in predominantly uh, all right, neighborhoods of color. So here's another map of West Dallas specifically, is that uh, concrete ba batch plants, a major polluter in West Dallas, history plotted in blue, as well as schools plotted in yellow. So here we can see schools are within a two mile radius of one of these industrial plants. So looking back for nearly 50 years, from 1939 to 1984, the West Dallas area was home to a major lead smelter operated by the RSR Corporation. So facility operators spent car batteries and scrap lead. The company sent resulting waste materials, byproducts, and batteries to nearby landfills where these wastes contaminated soil, sediment, and groundwater. 
So three landfill sites were consist or consisting of battery chips and slag. Wind also would transport uncontrolled stack emissions of lead dust from the smelting operations into the nearby parks, schools, and neighborhoods. So looking, this is a picture looking east. We see a view of the RSR core, which shows located next to a middle school. So this is the, uh, this is the middle school right here. All right, this is where the plant is, and we see low-income housing a mere 50 feet from the property line. So um, that was built by the Dallas Authority, Housing Authority in 1952. So we get back to this picture again. Maybe. No, we don't. Uh-oh. So we get back to this picture where I grew up, 615 North Ham Hampton. Um, if you take a little bit step back, I ended we. This house uh, was uh, about two miles away from this Superfund site, um, and more closely where the concentrations of those batteries were um, a mile away. So this is one of the, the, the designated sites. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So it was a Superfund site. So in the 70s, high levels of um, lead were found in children's blood in West Dallas and become serious problems. So in the 1990s, the EPA eventually declared the land in West Dallas surrounding uh, the abandoned smelter to be a Superfund site. They assessed nearly 7,000 properties and cleaned up the yards of over 400 properties between 1991 and 1994. So some lead levels in the soil were as high as 9,000 parts per million. And in the landfill sites, the lead was as high as 62,000 parts per million. So what we know is that there, oops. So there is no cure for lead poisoning. That is why preventing exposure to lead, especially among children, is important. We know lead is a neurotoxin that affects the brain, nervous system. And once it's ingested, the lead is deposited into your bones, teeth, and even the brain. And children do not have a blood-brain barrier. And it is extremely vulnerable to the lead exposure. So finding and removing sources of lead from children's environment is needed to prevent further exposure. Right? Uh, so the lead exposure can be actually passed from a mother to their unborn baby while pregnant through breastfeeding. So lead poisoning does not discriminate based on race, but decades of discriminatory housing practices have created situations in where black children in West Dallas and poverty are twice as likely to have elevated lead le blood levels, uh, lead blood lead levels than poor white children. Uh. So this was, uh, again, something else pulled directly from the EPA's website. And you don't have to read all of this, but um, in, their, in their spin of it, they said, West Dallas will continue to thrive based on their work. So what did I do? I went down there to see, well, are they thriving? Uh-oh, no. Ah, I'm doing this. So are they thriving? So it, yeah. So yet in the three decades followed that followed since this site has been done, toxic substances continue to persist long after the plant's closure. So this star here is where the plant is located, and we are looking at the former RSR smelting site. So in the, the EPA report, potential exposures existed. Ah, no, it doesn't want to work. Going backwards. Okay. So the EPA report exists that for those people in West Dallas from ingestion, inhalation substances pre present in the contaminated soils located at these sites. So what I did is that since science is a cool thing, right, do you trust that they actually cleaned up all of... Well, I have soil samples from here, so if you want to pass them around. And you can play with them if you want to. Say what? Don't lick it, yeah. So these, so the one that you see this exposed soil right here, it was directly across the street from the old site. Not to alarm anyone, but 
Truck drivers who hauled away waste from the smelter used to offer cash to the poor people living in nearby uh, neighborhoods in exchange for letting the battery waste to be dumped into their yards. So no records exist where or when they were dumped, but after all these years, they still turn up. So therefore, um, I argue that the EPA either did not dig deep enough when cleaning out the soil at their properties or may have overlooked entirely properties altogether that were clearly contaminated. So the concentrations from the EPA report, it says that the highest lead concentrations generally coincided with locations where battery chips were observed. Uh-oh, y'all are touching it. I'm kidding. I'm not. So just reading and doing research into this area where I used to grow up, so residents will always feel beneath their feet the broken batteries and lead slag that wound up in hundreds of residents' yards given away as fill. So even the... Uh, the enforcement of these, the 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 enforcement of the of the I just totally blanked. Uh, so the the violators. There we go. So the enforcement of the violators is even disparate. Like it's not equal to. It's still unjust. So the National Law Journal uh, noted growing racial disparity in the enforcement of environmental law by the EPA. So not only are the people of color differentially affected by industrial pollution, but they can expect different treatment when it comes to the enforcement of these laws and cleanup procedures. So we can see between 85 and 91 that when a polluter polluted in a community of color, the average fine was $55,000. When you polluted in an area predominantly white community, the average fine was $333,000. So it's not equal. And why is that? So the, the lens that I use in a lot of my research is environmental justice. So this is the, the, the protection from environmental and health hazards, fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, uh, regardless of race, color, income, and gender. So equal access to the decision-making process to have healthy, yeah, healthy uh, environment in which to live, learn, and work. Good thing I have five minutes. So even though that the towering smokestack is no longer visible, it still casts an ominous shadow of the past. Addressing environmental issues with a business-as-usual attitude cannot be our way forward. We must work towards a future where environmentally concerned citizens come to understand by virtue of spirited debate and animated conversations about nature and consumption. Getting there means challenging the dominant view, the production, technology, efficient, oriented perspective that infuse contemporary definitions of progress and requires linking exploration of the natural to the politically charged issues that challenge the political imagination. Walking this path means becoming attentive to the underlying forces that narrow our understanding of the possible. And that is the end. Ah. Also, I like to think that I am a uh, good luck to the city of Dallas because the year that I was born, uh, they actually shut down the, 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 the facility, the, the smelter, and not surprisingly, I won cutest baby of Dallas of 1984. Let's give, let's give him another round of applause. So we have some time for questions. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute so that we can hear. What do you think of the perspective of people like uh, say Naomi Klein? Do you do you know her or uh, maybe not. It's never mind then. Okay. What does Naomi Klein have to say though? Uh, she talks about how climate change is interconnected with how the globalized economy is actively working against measures towards climate change. Um, so I, I, I have my issues with like sustainability development because, um, how can we truly be sustainable in a economic system such as capitalism that is progress and just, it just keeps expanding. That's if you're not growing, you're, um, expand, you're not making any money, but then also it's also, um, it comes to the issue of what are we sustaining, right? We want to sustain our way of, 
consumption here in the United States, like us as individuals, at the expense of the global south. So they are not only do they not have the same resources, right? We're exploiting them, paying them less money. But then also they're expected to equally bear the, the brunt of all of the, the issues that come with it in climate change. So uh, that's the short answer. Any other questions? Yes. So if recycling is a scam and it's kind of difficult to make changes individually, is there anything you would recommend people can do to still make a change? Or is it like just corporations? I think it's going to take a collective uh, imagination, a shift in our ideas. And I, I don't want to say that it's a scam because it's doing good, right? But the, uh, the, the reliance that, because I, I was telling my class today is that I, I quit using straws because I felt guilty because they were stuck up a turtle's nose. Like it was my fault that that happened, right? We do, we're, we're worried about like our individual actions and it's really going to uh, miss the point in why are we have such a reliance on straws or plastic or just consuming as much as we do. So, I mean, that's again, it's, these are tricky questions that I, that I don't have the right answer. I just have a answer. So it's not, my way is not, uh, I don't want you to think that I have, oh, just this knowledge because I don't. I want to go back to the part, uh, I think I kind of want to add on what Patrick is saying, but back to the part where you put the car batteries in the soil uh, on that part. But, yes. Um, is I kind of learned that um, all wastelands, like for example, like anything from garbage goes into the waste. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that just add on to like waste, which is so harmful to the environment whenever you put carbides in the soil on that part? I'm gonna move to my peers. Anybody have any answers? I got, I, I don't have any other ways to say this, but um, it's pretty much, um, I know it's the part where it's like, the the soil that we just explored, where you, where it's in Dallas, um, it kind of feels like um, you're adding kind of like waste into the soil, sort of, sort of scenario, pretty much. Um, I know that they're, in a lot of instances, like they'll just scrape the top layer off and ship it somewhere and put it in a more contained area and they'll, they'll monitor it uh, to make sure that it's not leaking into the water sources. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the point of this one is, is that, there, that it happened for so long, and then the idea too with Dallas is that um, I, I took out how the city of Dallas itself had these practices and funneled everybody into this, like uh, black residents into that area, and then they justified it, right, because they didn't have the means to, mu to move, that they that they were okay with being polluted or okay in living in these conditions, but then when the EPA come in, I, I the, that that picture with the the lead chips on the ground that wasn't mine. That was just a a a, a gimmick. It wasn't a gimmick, but those that's really those were really pictures from the soil whenever they built that 7-Eleven. So the dirt that you're touching is not really contaminated with oil or with lead. Hopefully, I'm not going to say that it's not. <laughs> Don't sniff it. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, I guess I could use one. Don't give me one of these. It's not a good idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you're right. So when you add in a contaminant, it doesn't just sit at the surface. So soil properties and pedogenic attributes of the soil, it'll allow that to leach down. And so then you get into the parent material. Sorry, you should make me shut up, James. Um, <laughs> But it'll, it'll then transmit that water. And where does that go? So you may have like a remediation radius in a buffer zone, but beyond that, are you really cleaning it up? And the answer is no. Like you're not fully, you're never gonna clean it all up. Right, and so. because we did an undergraduate project where we actually looked at it under the microscope and there's still elevated levels of lead uh, you can see the ring of where that smelter was, and then we looked at it under a scanning electron microscope, and it's still uh, highly concentrated the closer that you get, and the further you get out, it, it dissipates. But it's still, 
within the acceptable limit, but what is the acceptable limit? Yeah. has to go through before it's deemed safe for planting food that's going to be widely distributed? Ooh, I, I'm not a farmer. I would. I don't know. That's a good question, though. But so I also think, too, okay, so when we think of climate change and uh, something like Salt Lake City, so, um, and the, the Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake, right? I think that's what it's called. What is it? Is it the Great Salt Lake? Um, so it doesn't funnel out anywhere. Right, so it's all of the, the stuff that has been deposited into it uh, is there, and it's terminal. But so there's an issue with that lake drying up. So then what happens is that there's a city, Salt Lake City, that's right next to it. And if that lake dries up, right, you have the fugitive dust or the fugitive dust, however you say that word. But with all that contamination that's in it, and it can pose real serious harms. And, but so that's a different way of thinking about uh, the, the problems with, I guess, bad things in the, the sediment is that the wind is going to pick it up, and then you're going to breathe it, and then what happens? And you can't. That's probably going to be a little bit more harder to contain. Oh, questions. This is a good one. There's a lot of questions this time. Okay. Um, I appreciate that you brought up the, the fact of looking at the, in the recycling as, because that's kind of a deflector um, against the primary issue, which is the corporations, big money. And it made me think that when we're a room full of students like this is thinking about our responsibility of voting, looking at the leaders that we're voting into office that are not um, protect them. They have big money in their pocket. So, for instance, when I was taking an environmental sociology class, um, talking about like when the Industrial Revolution came into place, there was actually government funds to help fund that change. But when we're talking about now solar energy and everything, they will not back and fund and give some of the gr government grants to get that stuff off the ground. So, uh, just a comment to not leave that with people thinking that there's nothing that they can do. No, know, right, right. And so it's, it's going to take uh, active engagement from all stakeholders. But I think we need to also resist the idea that simply voting is enough to make change. We need to, uh, doing that, doing your bit, voting but with, your, with your pocket or your wallet is kind of one of those things that they say. That's kind of, that misses the point. So it's going to take... Uh, I think a lot more, but yes, you can vote and be very aware of who you're voting for. And, but being just community involvement, right? It doesn't end at just the big elections. You have local elections, you have, uh, you could, I don't know, there's a lot, but yeah, it, it's not hopeless. We can make change, but we need a collective understanding um, of, to ensure that that happens, so. Wonderful. One more round of applause. Thank you.